What's going on folks? Welcome back to the channel. So today we are going to spend a few minutes talking about these barn doors that I built here behind me. A few years ago when we bought this house, the previous owners wanted to take their doors with them and we were pretty much okay with that since we didn't love them. They were very rustic and not really our style and we knew that we wanted to build our own. One of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted to work with mahogany since it's a species of wood that I've never worked with before. And I also wanted to use some glass because I wanted to make sure that I had plenty of light coming into the office since I spend most of my day in here. The last thing that I needed was a little bit of privacy so we wanted to make sure that we went with something that was opaque and we ended up using an etched glass that we ordered and I'll put a link to all the suppliers that I used in the description down below. So with that, if you guys want to know how I built these doors, stick around, I'm going to show you how I did it. I'm often asked, what is the most difficult part of woodworking? And to be honest, this is it right here. It's the planning part. It's making sure that you are as efficient as possible to have the least amount of waste with the materials available to you. For this project, I decided to go with African Mahogany, which at about $12 a board foot cost me over $500 in material for this project. And while the beginning of the project is the most exciting because I finally get to do something, it's also the most terrifying because if I do this part wrong, I'm either going to have too little or I'm going to waste and run out of the materials that I have on hand. The second most terrifying part of this project was my first cuts. Mahogany is incredibly heavy and it's also incredibly hard. And for that reason, Working alone on this project at times was a little bit challenging, especially when we first started off and this material was pretty raw and it was in its original and heaviest form. I mentioned many times that I learned a lot of lessons during this project. One of them was to slow down. I have no client for this project. I have no customer. This project is for me. And yet my competitive side always wants to finish things as quickly as possible. However, the Navy SEALs have a mantra that says, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. When you move as quickly as possible, mistakes will always happen. But if you take the time to slow down and be methodical about what you're trying to accomplish, that is when you finish things in a timely and efficient way, and it requires less redos and often keeps you safe from harm, as I just showed you. So now that we have cut everything down into a general size, this is basically what the door is gonna look like. Actually, one of two doors. We've got uh, 11 and three quarters inch down here, six inches in the two middle pieces, and then eight at the top, and then six on either one of the sides. And that's the other door stacked up right there. So the plan is now to start milling everything down to its actual size. We also need to come down to our final thickness. So first thing we're gonna do is plane these um, down to all, everything needs to be the exact same thickness, all of these pieces so that we have everything nice and lined up. And then we will take the new joiner and make sure that all of our edges are perfect. So we've got a little bit of work to do before we can start assembling, but at least now we've got a general idea and look and feel of what the entire door will look like. So now that we have the material cut down to its general size, it's time to get everything milled down to its final width, length, and thickness. My little planer worked extra hard to get everything done. It's not really meant for these really heavy pieces, but sometimes you just have to work with what you have on hand. Now one of the reasons why I didn't cut everything down to its final size was simply because of the weight of this mahogany. Because of the limitations of my equipment, it just simply meant that sometimes I had to do things twice instead of doing them all in one shot. But you do what you have to do with the equipment that you have on hand.
One of the personal benefits of working on this project was that I got to upgrade a few pieces of equipment and I also got to buy some new equipment. Most notably, I was able to buy this tabletop grizzly joiner. To be honest with you, I am not exactly sure what I ever did without this piece of equipment. I've always been skeptical of buying equipment that you're only going to use once in a while, but the reality of it is that I couldn't have done this project to the precision that I needed this project to be in without this joiner. Now that all of the wood is milled down to its final size, it's time to work on the most technical part of this project, the mortise and tenons to join everything together. Now if I wanted to do this in a simple way, I would have borrowed or bought a Festool Domino, but instead I wanted to learn a new skill, which is to actually cut all of these mortise and tenons myself. Have I ever done mortise and tenon before? Well, not really. Have I seen it done before? Yeah. Of course I have. So what's so hard about this? Well, it's pretty hard. And I loved it. As I've mentioned many times before, one of the things that I don't have is a lot of fancy equipment. I don't have equipment that actually cuts a mortise and tendon for me. So I had to come up with a few different ways of making these cuts. I started off by making sure that I measured exactly where I wanted each one of these to go and how the mortises lined up with the tenons. My first challenge was to cut the mortises themselves. I have a router which I can use to plunge in and cut the mortises themselves, but where do I start? Where do I end? How do I keep it from moving side to side? And I came up with this plan, which was to take a drill press with a quarter inch forcer bit and cut the beginning and the end of where the mortises would go. Which brings me to my other piece of equipment that I bought. A drill press, something that I've always wanted and I always felt that would be useful. And don't get me wrong, I didn't get a super expensive floor model. I bought a tabletop and it worked just fine. It worked perfectly in fact. I think one of the most satisfying parts of doing this particular piece of the project was the sound of the Forstner bit cutting into that mahogany. I know this sounds weird, but the sound of mahogany being cut when you can hear it is very different than anything else that I've ever cut into. Because of the way mahogany is structured and because it is, as I've mentioned, incredibly hard, it simply sounds different. And like I said, it's oddly satisfying. Look like butter. It moves like butter. I did forget one more thing. Gotcha. This next part of the project is where I actually earned my money. Not that I made any money on this, but still, I feel like I earned some money on this. Anyway, it was time to build a small and yet effective jig on top of my workbench. Pretty simple plan here. Put a piece of wood in my table saw that keeps the router from dancing back and forth and use the pre-drilled holes that I had drilled with my drill press to indicate the beginning and end of the mortises. Lastly, I sandwiched the material between the table and a two by six to make sure we had a level surface for the router to ride on.
I didn't want to plunge cut the entire depth of the mortise all in one shot. So I ended up doing three different passes at three different depths and that seemed to do the trick and I had almost no tear out whatsoever. The finished product, not bad, not bad at all. Now that we have a rough cut of the mortises, and you'll see what I mean by rough cut here in a few minutes, it's time to cut out the tenons. I played around with this in a few ways. I started off with a wheel marking gauge, and then I ended up using a marking knife with my square. Both of these were fairly effective, but the reality of it is, is the best way to minimize tear out was to use a little bit of painter's tape along with marking each one of the edges. Once again, I'm using my limited tools to the edge of its capabilities. I have a very simple rigid table saw along with an adequate data blade and a very good miter gauge that I purchased from Rockler. And we simply started cutting each one of these tenons. I wanted the final thickness of the tendons to be a half an inch to match the mortises, which means that I had to take half an inch of material from both sides of the tenon and cut the tenons length to match the mortises. With the limitations of the tools that I have on hand, this miter gauge was a game changer. It has a built-in stop to make sure that I have the tendons cut to the exact same length for every single one of these horizontal pieces that are going into this door. Once I'm done cutting the initial length of the individual tendons, I'm able to lift the stop which allows me to take out the rest of the material for the tendons. Keep in mind this is just a rough cut of the tenons and later we will have to shape these to fit properly into each one of the mortises. Another place where I earned my money was shaping these tenons to fit properly into each one of the mortises. There was no way for me to cut these straight out of the gate with the tools that I had on hand. But I did get to learn another valuable skill using my chisels. And along the way, I also learned some things about chisels that are invaluable to anybody who ever needs to use them. Tools that aren't sharp don't work very well. And unfortunately, with the first couple of tenons, I learned that the hard way. So take the time, make sure that you get a nice clean edge and let the tool do most of the work. In case you're wondering what those background voices are, whenever I do anything like woodworking or lawn work or any projects like that, I really enjoy listening to books. This particular book is titled how to Astronaut by Terry Virts. It's a fascinating book written by a real astronaut that goes over the nitty gritty around what it takes to launch humans into space. And he talks about it in excruciating detail, everything from the engineering to how to keep astronauts alive in microgravity and the vacuum of space. I listen to all kinds of books, not just these nerdy astronaut books. I also like nonfiction and some biographical books. In any case, if you're wondering, 
That's what I'm listening to in the background. And there are some serious medical issues that astronauts face. Space adaptation syndrome. The feeling some type of dizziness, headache, or down was extremely painful, and I felt like it. Our flight surgeons had marked an X on everyone's butt with a Sharpie before launch to help us avoid that nerve. I am not kidding. So, we each dutifully floated by our crew medical officer, Velcro-laden shorts hovering in my vision would change once in space. Good news for me is with the vast majority of my back on Earth. The bad news is... In case you were wondering, yes, I had to custom fit each one of these tendons in each one of these mortises. It reminded me of a verse in the Bible, Psalm 139.14, which partially states, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, each one of these tendons were fearfully and wonderfully made to fit perfectly into each one of these mortises. Now that we've completed our first dry fit, and for the most part was pretty successful, it's time to cut the groove for the glass in the door. I started off by cutting the groove all along the inside edge of each of the vertical pieces for the door. Fortunately, I had my lovely wife to assist me with this because these pieces are not only heavy, I also wanted to make sure that as I cut these grooves, they did not go all the way past the last mortise. Once I completed the vertical pieces, it was time to cut the grooves in the horizontal pieces. I had to cut both sides of the two internal pieces, and for the bottom and top pieces, I only had to cut the inside. While the process was pretty straightforward, it was extremely nerve-wracking. We've gotten this far. The last thing we need to do is slip up and make a fatal mistake. With the glass groove complete, it's time to do our second dry fit. We start off by putting some foam inside of the grooves. The reason why I put foam in there is because the glass is one quarter inch thick and the groove is three eighths of an inch thick. I wanted to make sure there was plenty of room for the glass to move freely, but I also don't want the glass to rack around inside of those grooves. This foam was just thick enough to keep the glass from moving too much but it also allows the wood and glass to move with temperature changes. These doors are inside, so I don't anticipate the temperature or humidity levels to change very much, but you never know. And I wanna make sure that we use every precaution that we can in order to make sure that nothing splits later on down the road. At this point, I'm getting a little uneasy about using a mallet, which made these Surefoot aluminum bar clamps extremely useful in pulling everything together and making everything nice and tight. When we get to the final glue up, these bar clamps will be key. Now that we've had a successful dry fit, it's time to finish the inside edge of these doors. 
one of the things I kept thinking about was what's going to be the best way to finish these inside edges without making a big mess on the glass and on the edges themselves. The solution was to finish the inside edge first before doing our final glue up. So we used the clamp on my table to hold everything and we went through the process of doing a nice 220 grit sanding and clean up before putting on our finish. For our finish, we are going to be using Rubia Monocoat. To be honest, I've never used this before, but I've heard it's incredibly easy to use. You simply wipe it on, use a scotch Rite pad to work it into the grain of the wood, wait a few seconds, then wipe everything off and let it cure for a few days. With this being the first time I've ever used Rubia Monocoat, I was really impressed at the simplicity of the product and the way it cured and finished. I'm really hoping that this is going to be an excellent finish for the finished product. The time has finally come for the final assembly. We start off by putting all of the foam padding inside of the glass grooves. And then we have to go through the excruciating part of making sure that everything is glued properly. Now don't make fun of my gluing technique. It's the way I chose to do it and it worked. The glue was a little bit thick, but we made sure that we covered all of the surfaces that we wanted glue. And we also had to avoid putting glue where the glass was going to go. Again, we want to make sure that this glass moves freely so that as temperature and humidity changes occur, the glass and the wood do not bind up together. The process of glue up is pretty straightforward. Make sure we put glue inside of the mortises and that we put glue on the tenons. Put all of the horizontal and the vertical pieces together and then slide the glass in between each one of the horizontal pieces. Once we get the glass and the horizontal pieces attached to the bottom rail, or in this case the side rail, it's time to do the other side. Fortunately, I had an excellent helper in my daughter. She came out and helped me glue, made things a lot faster, and she was able to help me with the final assembly. And just like we did during the dry fit, I used these bar clamps to pull everything together without having to beat on them with a mallet. Once we finished one side, we moved on to the next and pretty much did everything we did before. If you look at my driveway, you can see in the time lapse that it's now getting dark. We started assembly around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, took about an hour for dinner somewhere in the middle, and we finished up around 9.30 that night. The next morning was like Christmas morning. I couldn't wait to get these clamps off and take a look and see how everything turned out. To say I am happy with the way this has turned out would be a massive understatement.
And now, the fun part, sanding. My least favorite thing, other than finish work, to do on any project. And if you'll notice, I have a new tool in the shed. It's a Festool Rotex. And before I get grief for spending the money on a Festool, let me tell you, the reason why this stuff is so expensive is because it works. Did it save me a bunch of time in sanding? Probably not. But did it make my life easier as I was sanding? Absolutely. Does it make a difference to buy a Festool? Well, to me it did. And that's all that matters. Before we do the final finish on the doors, we have to prepare all the holes for not only the rails, but also for the door handles. I want to make sure that the top is completely even when it comes to hanging on the rails. If the bottom is uneven, nobody's ever going to notice. But if the top is uneven, everyone will notice. In order to minimize tear out as I drilled these holes into the door, I did two things. I started with taping the back of the door and I also took three different incremental passes to get to the final diameter of each hole. Even though this was only a dry fit, it was incredibly satisfying to see the initial hardware installed on the door. The only, there's only one person on this planet. Other than listening to books, apparently I also like to talk on the phone while I'm doing some woodworking. Too old. We aren't quite done yet, but I couldn't resist taking a quick peek of what the final product is going to look like. I think we'll need some final adjustments, but for now, I think we're ready for our final sanding and our finish. There's light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not a train. Now that it's time for a finished sanding, I learned a little technique that I watched on the YouTubes, and that is to take a pencil and mark up the entire surface of where you want to sand. And then what you're going to do is you're going to sand until you no longer see any lines. This is a great way to tell if you have completely sanded the entire surface. While the Rotex does a great job of sanding, there's nothing wrong with a little elbow grease to touch up the final bits of sanding. Before we put on the Rubia Monocoat, we want to make sure that everything is completely smooth and we also want to make sure that everything is very, very clean. We vacuum first, and then we take a little bit of mineral spirits and make sure that we wipe down every bit of surface on these doors. We don't want any particles before we start this finish process. As we discussed before, the finish process with Ruby of Monocoat is pretty straightforward. I like using these giant syringes to move the Ruby of Monocoat from the can over to a mixing cup. The reason why we have a mixing cup is because there is a hardener that you can add to the Rubio Monocoat to make the curing process go a little bit faster. It's not a requirement, but it does speed up the curing process quite a bit. 
From here, we're simply pouring the Rubio model coat onto the surface and we're going to squeegee it across the entire surface of the door. We're doing this on both sides of the door, but we need to make sure that everything cures on one side before we move on to the other. This is why that hardener is really useful because if not, we're waiting seven days between applying this to the front and the back of the door. And like most people, I didn't want to have to wait that long. Once again, I have a lovely assistant to give me a helping hand. She stepped in and helped to squeegee everything across the entire surface while I worked the product into the mahogany with a Scotch-Brite pad. I just didn't want it dripping everywhere, but I need more in there. Once we've finished working everything into the mahogany, it's now time to wipe everything off. We first used a bunch of paper towels to take off all of the excess, and then we used a rag to wipe everything down and polish things off. The nice thing about this Rubio Mono Coat is in the name, Mono Coat, meaning it only really needs one coat of the product in order to be considered complete. Some people will put on a second coat, but for the purposes of this door, I only needed one. The end is finally in sight. It's time to install all of the hardware. We start by putting on the four hangers, two for each of the doors. And once we hang the doors, we'll work on the handles. I don't think I mentioned this before, but each of these doors between the mahogany and the glass weighs 63 pounds. I'm not a small fella, but these were a workout to get them in place. With final adjustments, the doors came together and there were a few tears in my eyes as I saw the finished product hanging in place. The final step, install the handles. These handles are specifically made for our barn doors so that you don't have a handle on the inside that's going to interfere with the door opening. When I looked for these handles online, most of them cost upwards of $300, but I was able to find these on Wayfarer for under $25 each. I'll put a link in the description if it's still available on Wayfarer for that price if you're interested. All right, folks, so I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. This was a long process, not just in building the project, but it was also a pretty long process in editing. To give you guys an idea, I actually recorded over 1.2 terabytes of 4K video, which equates to about 120 hours of video. I had to boil that down to 30 minutes, which to be honest with you was quite excruciating. It took me over a month of editing off and on to get to the final product and I learned a lot of lessons along the way. Not just in how to make these projects come together but also what is the best way to edit it so that we're more efficient and get things out a little bit more quickly. So with that I hope to get a lot more projects out this year. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video and if you have please like this video and if I've earned your subscription please don't forget to subscribe and if you want to be notified of future videos don't forget to hit that bell. Unlike my Lawn Shark videos that come out probably once a week, these are going to take a little bit longer. So that notification button is going to be key if you want to keep up with the projects as they come out. With that, I hope you have a blessed day and we'll see you on the next one.